Hey, you've reached Mike. I'm not here right now, but please leave a message after this podcast. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, the day is fast approaching and tickets are selling out. January 22nd, I will be in Phoenix, Arizona for Potterless Live. My guest will be Johnny Frolicstein. We will be doing Wizarding World The Bachelor, which is going to be absolutely fantastic. I've just done the prep work for it. I'm so excited. You're going to love it. If you want to get tickets before they sell out, which they are doing, we're over two thirds sold. Head on over to bit.ly slash Potterless PHX, all lowercase, and I'll be very excited to see you there. We'll hang out after the show. We can grab a drink. It'll be fantastic. And if you live just a little bit north and west of Phoenix and you want to come to a live show, if you're free on February 14th, you're in luck because Potterless will be live in Los Angeles with Horse as the opening act. Just a great little podcast that I have near and dear in my heart. We will be doing another edition of Wizarding World The Bachelor. For that one, one is going to be The Bachelor. One's going to be The Bachelorette. Ooh, and I have two different special guests that I'm very excited about. So if you want to get tickets for that show, you can head on over to multitude.production slash live. That venue in LA is very tiny, so those tickets will sell out very quickly. If you want to go, head on over now, multitude.production slash live. If I was trying to go to a show and it was sold out, I'd be sad, but you know what makes me happy? New patrons! We have a whole slew of new patrons, so shout out to Stephanie Coldell, Molly Moran, Hannah Pelmas, Stina Paulson, Kirsty, Haley Himmelsbach, Zoe Hornung, Lily Green, Noah Warshawski, Kimmy Custodia, Hannah Ostendarp, Claudia Dong, Rebecca Morton, Judith Nielsen, Laterney109, Ella Mason, Carla Chan, Carrie McDonald, Britt Verschuren, Sophia, Thomas Richens, Bethany Letier, Margot Jaure, Aina Lockeran, Caitlin Kaus, Catherine Brewer, Carla Jobbly, Sophie Wilk, Ritwick Siddhartha, Devar Karuni, Gam Sausage, Victoria Barnes, and Pama Krizbkowska. Shout out to Thanos Kuvaras, Franka Ziesler, and Chloe Harler who upgraded their pledge, and a huge shout out to our new producer level patrons, Kyle, G, Maximilian Voss, Luca Holbling, and Don't Call Me Nymphadora. They joined the ranks of Vicky Aaron, Jesse Clow, Marchismo, Samantha Juan, Rose Marie, Marie, Lisa, Romina, Audra, Eleanor, Rossanne, Nikita, Ali, Amelia, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Moster, Ingen, Alex, John, Noel, Emily, Liz, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Rory, Gloria, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Friday, Ivor, Naomi, Summer, Andrea, Lynn, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Mark, Polly, Netta, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Addie, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Alicia, Kafir, Lindy, Sarah, Marta, Erin, Eileen, Violet, Lindsay, Keegan, Miranda, Gail, Ann, Mr. Folk, Maya, Kieran, Lily, Wire Warrior, Floor, Siri, Georgia, Peter, Skyla, Adele, Professor, Threat, Ellie, Daniel, Lee, 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 Elizabeth, Michael, Tiffany, Kelly, Carrie, Connie, Mary, Jennifer, Jaden, Nedry, Will, Samantha, Kayla, Aurora, Emma, Out of Context, Marcos, Hannah, Courtney, Victoria, Marie, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, Julie, The Meadows Family, Ginny, Anna, Fake, Brianna, Jenny, Sarah, McKenna, Mary, Joy, Heather, Dead Cat Lady, Javi, Darlene, Brad, Thomas, Charlotte, Brianna, Kevin, Lori, Chrissy, Bugaboo, Jarl, Haley, Emma, Ashley, Pita, Sophie, Jack, Jen, and Nicole, Callahan, Kylo, Leah, Melissa, Jordy, Bella, Melanie, Bill, Victoria, Joe, Elizabeth, Britt, Molly, Becca, Anthony, Reese, Adam, Joseph, Courtney, Team Run, Madison, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Who never forget to attend a meetup between friends that they've even put on their own calendar, but they still didn't show up. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, director's commentary, exclusive merchandise, live streams, and more, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 108 of Potterless, the second of three parts about the movie version of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, guest starring Miel Bredo and Bettina Campomanes. <laughs> Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man who didn't read the Harry Potter books as a kid. He then read them for a podcast, and now I'm reading the movies for that same podcast. Hey, Editing Mike here. Yep. Past Mike just said he was reading the movies for the first time. He is not doing that. He is watching them. Obviously, what a buffoon that Past Mike is. Anyway, back to the podcast, which we made it four seconds without a mistake. Come on, Past Mike. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm that grown man, and I'm here joined today by two lovely human beings, fine friends from yesteryear that have made it past our beloved app getting murdered by Twitter, and we still talk and hang out and stuff, and you're still making things. It's Miel Bredo and Bettina Campomanes. Miel and Bettina, how's it going? <laughs> Buongiorno. Hello. Hello. <laughs> this is us now. Hello. <laughs> We're going to do the rest of the episode like when Harry Potter. I say hello like aloe vera, like aloe vera. <laughs> <laughs> so now that all the British listeners have stopped listening. Uh... <laughs> Harry's a right chub, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we are going to continue our discussion of the sixth movie, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. We actually got considerably far into the movie. Usually I have a pretty poor track record with oh, the movie Oh, because I'm here, baby. Yeah, you've been keeping <laughs> us on track. We're having too much fun. Talk about the movie. So we're going to kick it right off with a scene that I thought was interesting, which is before Dumbledore shows Harry the pensive trip and they oh go serious into Horcrux, he's like... So you and Hermione, huh? So y'all fucking? Is so that like? Fucking? So y'all fucking? <laughs> no? All right, 
I'll see you later, dude. Very interesting scene to add. Don't recall that being in the books at all, but he's just like, you guys, right? And then Harry says, no, nah, we're just friends. And Dumbledore's like, my bad. I wonder, I so desperately wonder if like when they were actually shooting it, they were like, man, we don't really have a way to get into this scene. It's feeling <laughs> bad. Uh, anybody have ideas for how we could, I don't know, transition into this very serious thing out of like a, the Great Hall scene? Some comedian in the back's like, do some crowd work. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harry, you and Hermione, huh? So what's what's happening there? Nothing? You sure? All right, cool. I I'll just ask love, you. what is the Wizarding World equivalent of man the weather, am I right? Like You fucking Hermione? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. XOXO, Gossip Girl. Maybe he runs the blog. Ooh. Like the Hogwarts hustle. Okay. Yeah, he, okay. he's trying to get... That's a side plot that didn't make it to the movie, unfortunately. Right. Definitely in the books, though. If he's in his robe and is selling shit. <laughs> 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 so then they start to do the pensive trip and the transitions that they do going into the pensive are really cool yeah, pouring in amazing. the stuff and Harry putting his head in and then it's all fady and as the scene is starting all of the buildings and the cars and stuff it's uh, they did a really good job of it it looks so cool it looks amazing I really enjoyed it one thing that made me very sad though is that the lady who runs the orphanage in the books she is supposed to be drunk off her ass mm. and in the movie she is not and that mm. made me sad she's supposed to be so freaked out by having to deal with having Tom Riddle in her orphanage and he's fucking shit up all over the place that she just drinks gin a ridiculous amount while talking to Dumbledore when he's asking about Tom Riddle and that's just omitted which I think is a really important part of her character arc is that she yeah. really likes her gin very unrealistic too for what like 1960s England running an orphanage I you assume I mean gin you and tonic's a British thing right they you love mean a <laughs> That was also one of the strangest things when I was watching Fleabag. They sell gin and tonic in, in a can? can. Why don't they do that here? It's proper. We've got freaking Bud Light Mango Aritas, which is nothing. Why? For local. That's too many syllables. Yeah. Lime Arita, <laughs> sure. Strawberry actually a great one. Mango Arita, ugh. So I thought they were called margaritas. They are. And but then we just put the flavor before as a separate word. That's just Bud Light marketing for you. Uh, I want a milk Arita. <laughs> Just a glass of milk with some ice in it. Bud Light did make something where it was like, what's that tomato? Clamato. Yeah, they made a Bud Light Clamata thing. Oh, like a michelada? I, I don't know. Don't give Bud Light that much credit. They don't deserve words pronounced correctly. <laughs> but they made one of those which is like, I never want Bud Light. I also don't want clam and tomatoes in my Bud Light. Oh, did you say clam? Because I heard crab, crab and goil. We're talking about the Hepler Prince. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, you can't see it, but I'm with it. Vine is Bow. back. So you've got Michael Gambon, who is supposed to be a young Dumbledore here. And the way that they young him up is giving him bad hair and an interesting jacket. He's a hot Mozart. <laughs> it's a weird... I don't know what's going on. I don't know what Michael Gambon... I'm going to... You know what? I'm going to Google. What he looks like? Just like when he's not Dumbledore, what does this guy look like? Hot. Michael Gambon is hot. He's <laughs> just like, like a please classic. Be hot, please be hot, please be hot. British guy. And then Google. Let me see it. He's not bad. He's just an old British guy. Yeah, he looks good. He looks like Ebony's hey. Scourge. That's what he looks like. <laughs> the hair extensions are a bit. Everything. I'm living. <laughs> <laughs> they just kind of like go out and <laughs> stop. Tape ends. He should have gotten You know how Dumbledore in. like wears the hat too? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What if he just takes it off and it's just the completely hair? bald? Oh, it's, like, it's like a Rasta wig <laughs> <laughs> attached to the hat. <laughs> Oh, like man. he decided to grow the two halves of his hair <laughs> just on the sides very no long. in the wizarding world no one's bald there's a spell for that <laughs> there should be <laughs> why not all the little problems like that should be solved no one should have glasses no, no. one should have Cancer. acne no acne. one no one should have a unkempt beard everything should be perfect Hagrid what are you doing that's more of a vibe that's an aesthetic he's going for <laughs> I look at Hagrid and I just say big mood big, big mood, mood. <laughs> So, after you have the flashback scene where you've got the pensive, all this other stuff, they show a transition scene of the outside of Hogwarts Castle, and you have two Death Eaters in their weird black smoke flying thing. They just try to fly into Hogwarts, and then the force field happens, and then they make this noise of like, ah, when they can't get through, and that's just the scene. What was, what was the attempt, you think? I don't know what the two rogue Death Eaters are like. Yeah, let's do it. We got this. <laughs> let's break in. I, they, you know, it was the who is Joe Pesci and what's his face from Home Alone. That's them. Daniel Stern. Sure. 
tall one. Yeah. <laughs> it's them as Death Eaters just trying to go Harry rogue. Harry and Marv, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're just trying to break in. We're going to steal Harry Potter. It was the sound of a tool chest falling down the stairs. <laughs> but I guess they had to show something that Hogwarts is under defense because right after they do this, they start to show the Draco scene where he's figuring out how the vanishing cabinet works. So I guess this is them being like, hey, the Death Eaters can't get in. Draco's on the case. But it just felt like a very silly transition scene. Well, just like also Voldemort's been working his whole life to execute this attack and mm-hmm. he's like let's just try two of them <laughs> just see just what fly, happens fly straight in in the middle of the day see if that works <laughs> just two yeah Dollhoff McNair go oh, oh. <laughs> bonk ow <laughs> it's what yeah they're in the big meeting Voldemort acts like it's a very important mission they leave and then he turns to Bellatrix he's like that shit's not gonna fucking work <laughs> <laughs> I sent the sticky bandits <laughs> <laughs> we just have to try it and see <laughs> can't leave any stone unturned So Draco goes into the Room of Requirement. They don't make it very clear that he's in the Room of Requirement. No, I was confused. There's just a big tapestry there, which I guess you're supposed to assume is there because in the previous movie, they destroyed the wall outside of it. Like they couldn't repair it with a single whip of the wand? Almost like they are wizards and they fix stuff all of the time. Filch is just like nailing in the tapestries (laughs) and god damn it. At the very least, have Filch put in bricks. (laughs) You're ruining the, I don't know, the whole- The magic of Hogwarts? How can the room of requirement work if the wall is not there? I don't- It has uh, a backup system. There's gotta be something. Okay, I know this is galaxy brain jumping off what we just said, but- Mm -hmm. Why is Filch even employed? This is a point that I raised at the most recent LeakyCon. There's only one of two things. You just like classism. One of the two extremes. One, Dumbledore is trying to be nice, and even though he's a squid, meaning his parents are wizards and he's not, so he should be able to do magic, but he can't, Dumbledore gives him a job at the school so he can still be involved. Give him a better job, man! Should give him a better job because wizards can do all of his custodial stuff with the flick of a wand, but still maybe he's like giving him a job so he's a part of the wizarding world. He's helping out, kind of like he did to Hagrid. But the other side- like 10 to the greenhouse, come on! Something more fun. The other side is that they're doing it just to dunk on Filch all the time. Like, hey, Filch, clean up this uh, (laughs) bathroom. (laughs) We could totally do it ourselves, but we're going to make this squid do it. this giant tapestry when we could repair the wall. Here's a mop. Hold it with your hands. (laughs) (laughs) It's classism. That's what it could be. It's classism. Why is he there? So they don't make it super clear that Draco's in the remove requirement, but he's there. And... I love, and they keep repeating it in the movie, the big dramatic removal of the rug or whatever the heck is on top of the big vanishing cabinet. It's always Draco doing this big to throw it all the way down. And he just looks so brooding and so moody, so dramatic. Because his suit is so tight. It is. It's hard. It feels between that, like what you were saying earlier about stage performance versus film. That felt like a stage performance move. The Word. gesture is so big. It's huge. I want to know, again, this is another, like, I want to know how much of that room is CGI versus how much of is it real things. Of him pulling the thing Well, just, down. like, all the stuff around it at one point. <laughs> the room. <'Cause, laughs> Not the rug. Because I, but also, I don't know, it's, it's a big rug. You think he could handle it? I think he could handle it. But imagine if they wanted to do the take again. Do they have a crane that, like, picks it up and puts it? How do they get it back on? I don't think it's that big, right? I don't, it's, like, the cabinet's pretty tall. Some poor set dresser's just throwing over and over. Ugh, yeah. Get it back. <laughs> so then we get to the Quidditch scenes, which I think pass, hard pass. Skip this part. <laughs> pass, skip this part. Fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. I don't know why they decided to keep this in the movie. I guess I think because they wanted to show Hermione and Cormac and Ron. But also, like, it kind of comes back later because she cheats for him. Yes, in and then when scene, Harry yeah. does later, right? Yeah, that's yeah. like kind of a plot point. I guess. I guess that's it. They're not really clear about how the tryouts go, though, because the way in the book is that Harry is the captain, so he is putting the team together. Mm -hmm. And as he says in the movie, nobody has a secured spot on the team. So even people that played last year, yeah, they'll probably make it, but got to figure it out. Anyone can make the team. But what doesn't make sense in the movie is that Ginny is helping Harry run the tryouts, and Harry even says, just because you were on the team last year doesn't mean you're on the team this year. But Ginny gets a pass? I don't understand. Maybe she auditioned one on one. Or maybe she's going to fucking Harry. She's just trying to get in on the, the bed. <laughs> 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 but yeah, ooh, ooh, hmm. So they do the whole tryouts. It's fine. I don't enjoy Quidditch at all. But I will say the CGI of this 
And the way that these Quidditch scenes are done, way better than in the previous movies. It's really nice. The slow-mo is cool. It looks more realistic. I enjoyed that a little bit more. It was a more enjoyable Quidditch watching experience than you get in some of the other movies. But That's the worst sentence I've ever heard someone say. <laughs> <laughs> it is. We just hit it. That was it. And it is a low bar, but it does it does look a lot nicer. I did appreciate, though, that most of Ron saves when he's saving the quaffle from going through the rings with his head. Well, that's a pretty good touch. There was like slow motion, too, where it's just like, mm. <laughs> yeah, it's just some subtle flexes. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those scenes that really made me feel good because... <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm such trash for kind of montage, like different okay. kinds of montages. Yeah, yeah. That's why I enjoyed like the fourth film so much. Everyone, like a lot of people hated the fourth film because yeah. it was just so like fan service. Mm-hmm. But I'm kind of, <laughs> I was just like, yes, give it to me. Give up. Give me all these games. Make it seem like a chick flick right now. The fourth I and just the fifth movie both have a lot of montages in them. Yeah. Are you big? In, I'm a big into like 80s montage, like every Rocky movie montage. I get so excited. Always fun. I feel like you need to have an over-the-top cheesy song in the background, and I think that's a little bit lost. In this scene? In this, in any montage now. You don't have people writing over-the-top songs for movies anymore like you did in the 80s, like where someone that's is specifically true. writing Eye of the Tiger for Rocky Three or something. Mm-hmm, danger Zone. Mm-hmm. More of that, please. Yeah, okay. So you think we should punch up that scene by putting an over-the-top 80s song behind it? Yes, <laughs> okay. exact same scene, but it is the song from the warehouse anger dance scene in Footloose. The one that's like, never, 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 never. Again, your reference points, <laughs> I don't understand. That's such an iconic scene. Kevin Bacon doing like random the gymnastics. The song that everyone thinks about from that is Footloose. Right, but that's not the <laughs> montage I'm brooding and I need to express my feelings in the or art of dance. Or any of the dance. songs they played during the dance in the fourth film. They were very edgy. Mm-hmm. They could have played that that's, in yes, the background. That's, yes, true. Need more of that. Then we get into the scene where Hermione confronts Harry for using the Half-Blood Prince's textbook. And I think they did this all in the earlier scene, and in this one especially, of Hermione not being able to cope with the fact of Harry being better than her in a class, and especially the thing on top of that, that he's doing it by cheating, so to speak. It and is cheating. It 100% Straight is. Up cheating. It is. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't air quote Everyone around it. Everyone in this movie is a fucking cheater, <laughs> including Hermione on her high horse. She cheats. Where does she cheat? She makes Ron oh, right. do good yeah. at the tryout. <laughs> no, she makes Cormac do bad at the tryout. Whatever. Still cheating. <laughs> That's doping. We saw oh. what happened to Lance Armstrong. It's true. We all had to throw out our Livestrong bracelets. <laughs> but I think she does a good job of freaking out towards Harry for using the book. Really get the emotion through. I thought it was really nice. And this was... One of the points, I think all of the main actors, Daniel Radcliffe, Emma Watson, Rupert Grant, I think they all have flashes of being really good. Well, they're throughout the kids. Movies. Yeah, 100%. We just didn't know yet. And again, mm-hmm. I can't imagine the directing was very helpful for most of these movies. Is David Yates a good director? I don't know him outside of the Harry Potter movies. And he familiar. directed this one. Me neither. Okay. <laughs> and you're the movie one. So, all right. So, David Yates sucks. <laughs> Moving on. Everything's his fault. I mean, also, like, the, with the project of the scale, it could be the script. It could, I mean, it could have been production. Like, there's a million ways for a movie to go wrong. So, I don't want to, like, blame the actors, but it I would, didn't help. I would, if we have to not blame someone, let's not blame the teenagers. Yeah, exactly. They're <laughs> there's kids. enough the going on The entire pressure them. of the world on them, I wouldn't be able to do well. That's bonkers. Unless I was Snape. You guys, get me cast as Snape. <laughs> <laughs> Then we've got the scene in Hogsmeade where Slughorn is inviting Hermione and Harry to come to the Slug Club, which is gross and I hate it and is poorly named. But you've got, he's talking to Ron. He calls him Wallenby, which I thought he called him Weatherby in the book, which was a callback to an earlier time when Cornelius Fudge called Percy Weatherby. Don't know why the movie would change it to something that sounds so incredibly similar, but slightly different. Hmm. But here we are making these choices. But then there was something in the scene that I didn't understand. And I'm hoping one of you two can make sense of this. They're in the scene. They're drinking the butterbeer. They see Ginny making out. And they're like, oh, Ginny making out. That's kind of weird. She's and... snogging. A mm-hmm. proper snog. <laughs> then Hermione takes a sip out of her butterbeer. Like she would drink. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> takes a sip out of her butterbeer after talking with Ron about, oh, if we started snogging and Ginny saw us, would you want her? Maybe this is her being embarrassed about that or whatever because she was doing the whole classic, I like you, so I'm going to make a hint about us yeah. making out thing, which I think was a pretty good move by Hermione. Very good. Yeah. The classic middle school move. Yeah. But then she has the little foam butterbeer milk mustache. mustache yeah. And then Ron says she has a little bit on it and she wipes it. And then she looks 
mortified. Like she's going to cry. Uh, wh- yeah. what, was it because of just that? Yeah. Is it the combination? I don't like she, the the reaction was like I watched it a couple of times. Like, did I miss a line? Did I miss something? Mm-hmm. Like she looks devastated <laughs> that she had a milk mustache. I feel like it's the association of just talking about kissing and uh-huh. then her him seeing her lip. Uh, you know? She, so she's like, See, she brought up yeah. being kissing. She's vulnerable. Now she's done something. And, now she's being seen. Uh, and she's, makes, makes yeah. her shy. And it is also, I've talked about lips and now my lip looks embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. right. It looks delicious. <laughs> let me, let me lick that up of you. <laughs> you want to kiss? I got some food on these lips. Maybe that's what it is. She was trying to get Ron to lick it off and it didn't work. And then she was like, oh man, my sweet <laughs> move didn't work. <laughs> I feel like it's probably, I mean, stab in the dark, not an expression. Now it is. A stab in the dark I'm stab taking dark. here is that. I think that whoever wrote this or directed it maybe was like, all right, no, Emma, you're a teenage girl. Importance on appearance is everything. So imagine for a second that you looked a little bit ugly. How would you respond? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Does, doesn't it feel like, like <laughs> you get no character depth whatsoever? Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> so after this, we get the Katie Bell getting possessed by the necklace scene. which. That is so scary! So terrifying, but really good. But it's so scary. That sound. She like shakes, is like thrown violently side to side, thrown up in the air. Her hair then looks amazing, though. Hair oh, in slow mo, really phenomenal. good. Phenomenal. And then the fact that her hands are completely outstretched, like she's Jesus Christ, is just. Oh, and then the zoom in on her face where she is screaming, and then by whatever the angle of the camera is, you can see all of her teeth. It's like so all scary. molars. It oh, is. Oh man. She looks. Terrified. She looked like Miranda Cosgrove in that, in that <laughs> angle. <laughs> it reminds That's me what I remember. of those illustrations in scary stories to tell in the dark. Ooh, I it can see it. It was genuinely terrifying. Damn, I want to mm-hmm. see it so bad. Because her body work stole that whole I wanna, scene. I want to know how much of that was CGI. Again, how much of that was CGI? Was she on ropes? Did they just like throw her around and <laughs> stuff? Maybe she's like 30. <laughs> she's underage. No, definitely not. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, that scene was really, really well done. Yeah, I agree. Another thing that was really well done immediately after, the jacket that McGonagall is wearing when she asks the squad about it. Chic. So it's chic. really good. The pointy shoulders and the funky collar. Category is powerful. I don't even know what that clothing item would be called. It's not a blazer. It's not a pea coat. It's something. It's amazing. I have to revisit that. It's really good. It's, it's just... <laughs> It's awesome. It's like I <laughs> where to cop. I uh, please, yeah. <laughs> let me cop the fit. I need it. She starts confronting the squad about it, and Snape is there too. Harry thinks it's Malfoy, and then they ask, "What is your evidence for thinking that it's Malfoy?" And then Harry says, "I just know." And then Alan Rickman as Snape just go- goes, "You just." No. <laughs> so drawn out. It's amazing. I love uh, him. It's so great. <laughs> It's also strange just going back and watching these movies. Snape is weirdly not in the movies that much, Mm. which is not what I recalled until you're watching the movies. And he's just kind of here or there. It feels like they give McGonagall some extra scenes to get some more Maggie Smith play. They give Bellatrix some more scenes to give Helene Bottom Carter more play. It doesn't feel like they add a whole lot of extra Snape. I think he has his time to shine in the seventh and eighth movies when Snape is a bigger character, but he's really not in the movies that much, which is like, you've got Alan Rickman. Why not? Well, scheduling, I can't imagine they had him that long. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. I don't know how filming and stuff works. World was you successful do. anyway. Like, I felt like he was there a lot of the time, but no. it, I guess not. Quality over quantity. <laughs> well, I, it could be the whole <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. What's the guy's name? Hannibal Lecter. Do you there. hear them scream, Clarice? <laughs> Talking about Anthony Hopkins? Yes, Anthony Hopkins. I think he won the Academy Award. He was only in the movie for like 15 minutes of screen time. Yeah, if you command the screen, then oh, people remember you. His presence is there the whole movie, even though he's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's ASMR for you. They should have made him sing like an outro to the credits. Oh. It's the yeah. silence of the lips. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's man. a movie that needs an 80 montage. That, oh, yes, where they're just trying to find them. What I want, you got <laughs> Just cut a guy's face off. That'd be really good. Hey, Pass Mike, you just said that cutting a guy's face off would be really good. Let's all just let this one marinate a little bit as we take a little break for Wingardium Adriatosa. Mm-hmm. 
Today's episode of Powerless is brought to you by DoorDash. Let's say hypothetically that you are going to be in Phoenix, Arizona very soon, and you won't have a car because you're flying in, and you're going to want to get food, but you're not going to be able to walk all over the place to get this food, and you also don't want to pay for Ubers everywhere. What's easier? Just getting the food delivered directly to your door, and how are you going to do that? You're going to do so with DoorDash. DoorDash connects with your favorite restaurants in your city, and ordering is so simple. They are actually accurate with when your food is going to arrive, which is very important for me because I usually order food when I'm hungry, and that's not what you should do, so I appreciate that I can anticipate when the food is going to show up. All you got to do is download the DoorDash app, open it up, choose what you want to eat, and your food will be delivered directly to you wherever you are. DoorDash has over 340,000 restaurants in over 3,300 cities in the U.S. and Canada, so you can find a new place, you can get something from your favorite little shop, or you can get something from a big chain like Chipotle. So don't worry about dinner in Phoenix, Arizona. Don't walk around. Don't take Ubers. Don't try to rent a car. Just let dinner come to you with DoorDash. And as a Potterless listener, you can save $5 off your first order of $15 dollars or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the promo code Potterless. So again, you'll get five dollars off your first order as long as it's fifteen dollars or more when you download the DoorDash app and use the promo code Potterless. Again, promo code Potterless at checkout, save five dollars and get some food delivered directly to your door and basically to your face in Phoenix, Arizona today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Skillshare. Let's say hypothetically that you sent an email to your engineering firm saying that your goal for the new year was to dunk a basketball and they sent this to the entire company and you didn't realize this was going to happen. Well, you need to put your money where your mouth is and back this up. So you're going to need to develop a new skill. Now, I don't know that Skillshare has particularly a class on how to dunk a ball. But if you did a similar thing where you said you were going to achieve something and it was sent in a company-wide email, you're going to need to back that up. How are you going to do so with Skillshare? Skillshare is an online community that offers membership with meaning. They have tons to explore. They have real projects that you can start. They can help you start that thing that you've been telling yourself you're going to do every new year for the past five years. Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. With Skillshare, you can make 2020 a year where you explore new skills or deepen existing ones or get lost in creativity. Whatever you're looking for, Skillshare's online classes are here for you. The classes that I've taken with Skillshare in the past have been great, and there's one that I'm thinking about taking. It was one of their top of 2019. It's called Styling Your Space, Bringing Creativity to Interior Design. It's taught by Emily Henderson, and I live with Kelly, my fiance, she's an architect, and she's been bringing a lot to the table in terms of interior design because she knows what she's doing. I have no idea what I'm doing. So it would be fun for me to take this course and learn a thing or two and then surprise her by contributing to the design of our apartment. I think that would be very fun. There's a bunch of other classes that they have, though, whether it is professional skills or creative things or something as simple as being better at Instagram photos or social media, Skillshare's got it all. And as a Potterless listener, you can explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Potterless and get two free months of pre premium membership. Again, two free months of Skillshare premium membership at Skillshare.com slash Potterless. So go to Skillshare.com slash Potterless, get two free months of premium, and start developing that new skill that you promised your entire engineering firm that you were going to develop today. And finally, today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Perfect Snacks. Let's say hypothetically that you are about to take occlumency lessons with Professor Snape, and you know that these lessons are going to be really long and drawn out and boring, and he's going to do it at weird times so you won't be able to have food beforehand. You're going to need to eat something on the way that's quick and delicious and fills you up for the duration of this entire lesson, what are you going to do? You're going to eat a Perfect Bar from Perfect Snacks. Perfect Bar is the original refrigerated protein bar. Yes, they're refrigerated, but that is good because it means they're free from chemical preservatives and by storing them in the fridge, you get optimal taste and texture. I've never enjoyed the texture or taste of a protein bar before and these Perfect Bars are so delicious, so creamy, so tasty, so peanut buttery. They're made with freshly ground up butter and organic honey. They have up to 17 grams of whole food protein and that cookie dough-like texture is unlike any protein bar that I've ever had or that you've ever had, I promise. They have a variety of flavors like dark chocolate peanut butter, coconut peanut butter, and almond butter. There's going to be something you love. My favorite is the dark chocolate peanut butter because I love dark chocolate. I love peanut butter. Putting the two together is absolutely fantastic. It's just little dark chocolate chips, and every time you get a bite with one in it, oh, it's just the right amount of sweet. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love them. And just because they're stored in the fridge does not mean they can't be taken on the go. I've taken them on hikes. I've taken them in airplanes before. I've taken them to the gym. Because Perfect Bars are good for up to one week out of the fridge. And if you have any sort of dietary restrictions, don't worry. They're gluten-free, they're soy-free, and they're kosher, and they're low-GI. That's fantastic. If any of this sounds interesting, you're in luck, because right now, Perfect Bar is offering 15% off your online order if you go to perfectbar.com slash Potterless15. This is a different code. They have switched the code. Again, this is perfectbar.com slash Potterless15 to get 15% off your order of refrigerated snacks. So go to perfectbar.com slash Potterless15. Save 15%. Get those amazing creamy protein bars in your possession so that you can eat them before your long occlumency lessons with Snape today. 
After the scene, you've got the great, I love, they did this really well of two teenage boys talking about their feelings, but not talking about their feelings, which is Harry revealing to Ron that he likes Ginny and Ron revealing to Harry that he likes Hermione. And the way that they convey this is by saying that the people that they're interested in have nice skin, which is very creepy, but also like very teenage boy of... It makes more sense for Harry because he's trying to tell his best friend, like, I think your sister's really hot. Yeah, that's a hard conversation <laughs> Which, to have. Can't imagine having that one. But uh, just very, very well done of teenage boys of like, I don't know how to express my feelings. I don't know what to do here. Let's say they have nice skin. So the next scene is the Slug Club dinner. And I already don't like the Slug Club. <laughs> it makes me very uncomfortable. The ice cream that they have. Oh. <laughs> this is the thing I wanted to say. <laughs> I don't think it's ice cream. I was looking at it. Okay. I think it's cream puffs. It looks Hmm. like a big ass goblet of cream puffs. And each one of them has about 20. They have a lot. It's It's a lot of sugar. It's a lot of sugar. I think it's both. It's a combination. Uh. That's a crazy person's move. Ice cream and cream puffs? He Only he would do that, though. Yeah, Slughorn would do that. He would do the most. That's like 10,000 calories per person for dessert? Yeah, they've already had dinner. Has and this now man they're not heard that. of wine and cheese? I thought he was a fancy person. <laughs> a bowl of cream puffs? Mm, Where's this beer? Pop up? Fuck off. Mm. What's also fun about the way that they shot this is clearly for continuity, they asked the people who had a lot of lines to not touch the ice cream so that you don't get the weird, oh, there's more food than there was in this because they're eating and the scene's going on blah, blah, blah. Except for Marcus Bowlby, who was entire joke is that he's just devouring the ice cream. He's just going to town on this ice cream, cream puffs, whatever. I yeah, that's the thing is everyone else was told explicitly, don't eat this. Well, you never actually want to eat regardless, right? Because you have to continually spit it out, Mm -hmm. and that super sucks. But if he had to be eating, that dude probably went through three cartons of ice cream. (laughs) Chewing it, spitting it out, hoping the camera's off you in time to spit it out. Otherwise, you actually have to eat it. That would be an interview I'd love to get. The guy who played Marcus Belby and be like, how much ice cream did you have to consume? How many takes? Because every time he's eating it, he's shoveling it down. And the joke is that there's supposed to be not that much left. So yes. how much is he eating? But also it like melts really fast. So like, it, I don't his know. His was all he... melty, which makes me think it's ice cream and not cream puffs. Because right. his had all the liquid around it. So I think but it is But it's harder cream. to kind of spit <laughs> Oh, you because can't. it's gonna That's why, be so like, yeah they just keep scooping it's it. gonna gargle like ew, ew, <laughs> ew, 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 ew. it's so visceral I'll a sommelier for ice cream i shot like a web only commercial where Ooh. i had to take a single bite of a cookie it was okay. a commercial so many less was cakes. it for a cookie brand or no it was, was just it like just... a random one-off bit in this okay. dumb commercial uh-huh. again web only commercial compared uh-huh. to a massive feature film. Sure. So this probably is like one tenth of what he had to do. Uh-huh. I think we went through about 15, 20 cookies by the time it was all said and done for a single bite. So now you're understanding this kid probably had to eat like literally five cartons of ice cream. <laughs> it <laughs> sucks so bad. <laughs> I don't envy him. How many pieces of cake did the kid and Matilda oh, have to eat? Oh, I don't want to know. <laughs> God, I hope they did that in like three takes. That poor kid. <laughs> so much sugar. The whole cake. <laughs> Straight up. Like, it's got to be authentic. <laughs> well, to shoot it, they had to, it was the whole cake in the shot, right? Yep. They probably yeah. had, like, literally 50 cakes on set to do that. Oh, my gosh. And then they had to look identical. Ugh. Dude, making films sucks. I don't know why you're doing it, Patina. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much work. <laughs> Quits immediately after this conversation. Just make podcasts. It's great. <laughs> Edit everything out. No one can see. Wear whatever you want. <laughs> but the actor who plays Marcus Belby says one of my favorite lines, which is while he's destroying this ice cream and Slughorn is asking him about his family, because that's the whole point of this meeting is let me just schmooze with these kids so I can talk about their important family members. Marcus Belby with a mouth full of ice cream is talking about his dad and he goes, oh, no, me and my dad don't get on. <laughs> which... He's not going to be invited back. <laughs> Marcus. <laughs> Definitely didn't know. They, they allude to it later on is that I think they made him work the bathroom at at the Slug Club, which is also strange that they are employing like children at the party. Like a bathroom attendant? Yes. Like giving you mints and stuff? Yes, which is always the worst. I never want a bathroom attendant. But once they are there, you do have to tip them. That's what, it's just, I can understand other things where you tip someone because in those situations, I cannot do the thing. If I'm at a restaurant, I cannot just get my own food. Mm-hmm. If I'm at a bar, I cannot just get my own drink. Mm. I can handle the bathroom. Like, I got mm, this. I don't know. I got this. I don't know. I will hold my own dick. <laughs> Thank you. I love that song. <laughs> Can I hold your dick? <laughs> but 
<laughs> you also get Cormac licking his pinky seductively at mm. Hermione, which mm. he's basically playing the child version of Gaston, where mm. that had to be kind of fun for the actors. Just like, just be a huge jerk. Mm-hmm. Like, it has to be kind of fun. I've been at Disney, and the actor who plays Gaston, that's got to be the best job in the entire park, because you just are shitty to children, mm-hmm. and then everyone's like, this is great. Mm-hmm. He does the whole character signing, so they got the whole line, and he comes behind, like, the door in Gaston's tavern or whatever. He just kicks the door open and then <laughs> sticks his arms out and goes, who wants to take pictures with me? Like, that's the best job ever. <laughs> Same. Oh, uh, you, you just get to be pompous for an hour and people eat it up and then you go backstage and chill. Yeah, but your neck has to be so thick. He, I think he was wearing like puffy inserts in his shirt. Either that or he was unbelievably Stop, bro. Yo, bro. <laughs> Gaston, drop that routine. Yeah, actually that's the thing is you do an hour of that and then 23 hours of push-ups. Traps. <laughs> Only traps. A later on scene, you've got the Quidditch match and you've got Ron being really nervous about the Quidditch game. They're in all of their sweaters, which actually look really nice. They have yeah. cool sweaters. They've really improved the clothing of Quidditch throughout because in the early movies, they're wearing these big robes, which seems not conducive to playing a sport where you are flying in the air. But it's their school's uniform that suddenly they no longer have to wear. It's just the directors keep changing it. I yeah. mean, they are still all wearing the same sweater. But here's the point that I wanted to bring up. All of the people on the team are wearing the exact same sweater. When Ron comes in, he looks unsure of himself. He's not confident. And then you hear someone in the distance scream, what is he wearing? It's the same guy who yelled, Snake! Yeah, just... <laughs> What's he wearing? He's wearing the same sweater that everybody else is wearing. Hey, editing mic here. Upon reflection, I realized that what the person who said, What's he wearing? could be referring to is Ron's helmet that he has on. Now, this also does not make any sense because when they get to the Quidditch match, the Slytherin Keeper is wearing the same helmet. So, I don't know what this person's problem is. I don't know why he's making fun of the Keepers for wearing helmets because safety is great, especially when it's your head. Ugh. Anyway, back to the podcast. Yeah, but it looks so bad on him. Weirdly, it did look a lot better on Daniel Radcliffe than it did on Ron. Yeah, it's all about the peck shape. Mm. I, Daniel's was a little more form-fitting. It was mm-hmm. like tailored to him a little bit nicer. Ron's was a little, little baggier in it. wanted to do it. like a Bone Thugs and Harmony and like look, and it didn't work. Look at Patina throwing out the bone, bone Thugs bone. and Harmony <laughs> reference. Bone, bone. <laughs> I don't know about old stuff, but I know about old music. Is that old? Fuck you guys. It's- I grew up listening to that. <laughs> Older in comparison. The other thing that didn't make sense to me in the scene is that Ron sits down for breakfast and his food is already there on his plate. And it's a weird, whatever it is, it's a bad, ugly egg and toast thing. Mm -hmm. Why does his breakfast have to suck? That's just English food. You're being offensive. (laughs) English breakfast is really good, though. That means it's yummier. Because it's uglier? (laughs) (laughs) Haven't you not heard of ugly Ugly delicious? delicious? (laughs) (laughs) But I don't understand. It's like, Ron, you could get other food. You're at the magic cafeteria where you can just get whatever food you want. But he's like, oh, I'm feeling sad and unconfident, so I need to eat shitty breakfast. What, egg with toast? You don't think that sounds good? It does sound it sounds good, but terrible to it, me. Looks, it looks bad on the plate. It's it's in this strange geometric design, and there doesn't the have a lot going on. The food styling budget was spent on the bowl of cream puffs. That's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> it went all into the ice cream. They're like, oh, crap, I've got one egg and some bread. <laughs> the crafty okay. person was like, this is not my job. This is not my job. <laughs> What do you mean? I got to make geometric shapes. <laughs> but Luna sitting next to Ron in that lion hat, very good. She's a so very, cool. She's the coolest. I can't believe Cormac McCarthy. That's not his name. Cormac <laughs> McClagan. Very close. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, the author of The Road. Um, I can't believe they're not <laughs> lusting after Luna. She's so cool. It's funny that in the way she was written at the time, Luna's supposed to be this weird girl that nobody likes. And then modern times, she's the coolest person yeah. in the school. Everyone would be friends with Luna. Also, it's not confirmed, but I'm pretty sure she grows up to be Emma Thompson's character. Mm. Pretty sure that's the same person. But. Mm, she grows up to be, what's her? Mm, I'm a Thompson's character. Trelawney. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but Trelawney kind of sucks, and Luna's cool. Yeah, you know, age changes people. <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> then you get the whole liquid luck scene where we def- we had this part. You were the guest for this part because this whole thing, it's just Space Jam. This is just the plot of Space Jam, what they do. Oh, Ron being really good? R- the whole Harry pretending to pour. Placebo effect. The placebo effect right, of, right, oh, right, I right. put the Felix Felicis in your drink. Like <laughs> Everybody it's- get up. It's time to slam down. <laughs> I don't get why the Looney Tunes and Michael Jordan didn't sue J.K. Rowling because that movie came out before that book did. <laughs> it's just Space Jam. <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> but speaking of 90s sports movies, Slytherin in the game runs the flying V for Mighty Ducks multiple times, which makes me very happy. It doesn't seem like a very conducive strategy in Quidditch, but I'm here for it. Okay. We're getting too sports heavy for me. I okay. Stop I will, listening. I will pull the ripcord and <laughs> sports are gone because I think that was the... Oh, no. Sorry. A couple things that don't make sense. <laughs> One, you still get people punching the ball into the goal. Throwing it would be so much faster. Nah. I can't think of, oh, here, can you toss me that, that anything? Yeah, let me just punch it at you. Would never happen in real life. Mm, have you ever played volleyball? That's just because the rule is... <laughs> My hand's not big enough to even hold anything that size, I think. It so would you just, have to punch. Like, you could hold the quaffle because, <laughs> as they reveal in Quidditch throughout the ages, the quaffle is charmed with something that kind of homes to your hand. I don't so, want to hear about the Okay. Sports, even if they're fake, it's so boring. <laughs> I don't care. I can't care. Last thing about it, I do enjoy that people fly into the rings. I think that's very fun. <laughs> Bling! Yeah, I hear like a sonic uh. effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> But yes, let's abandon Quidditch and talk about future things, which is the Quidditch after party, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, the setup, because Ron has a really good game, makes all the saves, everyone's very happy. The scene ends with them all chanting Weasley and then transitions into them at this Quidditch after party with everyone standing in a circle around Ron, who is on a pedestal, and they're all just chanting Weasley at him Still. while he stands in the middle in of the circle. Location. Yeah. Yeah, again, it seems like the scene transitions they had a hard time with. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very strange. But yeah, he's just standing there as confetti rains down. Lavender Brown then goes up to Ron, grabs him, and then kisses him. It's strangely, that is what Ginny does to Harry in the book. So in the book, there's another Quidditch match where they end up winning the House Cup because of it, and this is a big dramatic thing. Thing. Harry missed the game. It was a whole another side plot that they just deleted. And what happens is when they're celebrating the win afterwards, Ginny deciding to throw all caution to the wind of what Ron would think or all this other stuff just grabs Harry and starts kissing him. And then it's great. And Ron then approves of Harry, blah, blah, blah. But that scene's not in the movie. And then they've just decided to take that and then turn that into the Ron Lavender Brown thing, which feels like a weird copy paste of It seems like a surface level showing of affection, which is why I think it works from based on what you've said. Yeah. I also think it's fairly unrealistic, especially among teenagers, to be that forward ever. Mm-hmm. Have mm-hmm. you ever, especially in high school, just marched up to someone, grabbed him, and kissed him? That's nope. like a crazy move. No, I would have to ask Jimmy to ask someone <laughs> right? in study hall. And then it's like, can you guys leave? Yeah. <laughs> and mm-hmm. then you just sit there, and then you look at each other's mouths, and then like slowly it happens. Mm-hmm. Imagine if she said, is this okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then just does it. She but stops. that would have been consent. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta love it. Yeah, because he's not into her at this point, huh? He... It's like a little intense. Yeah. The book, they do a little bit of a better job of kind of g- arriving at it. But yeah, I think they tried to show at least Ron is aware that she likes him, mm. but he hasn't shown any sort of feelings towards her. So huge move on her part just to be like, yo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she went for it. She really did. She knew what she wanted. Hats she off to it. her. But the next scene where Hermione is sitting with Harry and being sad about it. Again, I think this is Emma Watson being really solid. I thought the acting of this particular scene was good. She feels mm. genuinely upset. This is where she's like crying downstairs all the birds. Yes. Yeah. I didn't like the direction of that either. What about it? Was it was just so dramatic. Yeah. Like when I got scorned, the person I love, I saw kissing someone else. And let's be real, liked. It's fucking high school. <laughs> We're talking about a girl who raises her hands yeah. <laughs> straight up. So maybe she's just that dramatic. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. I think I would have probably just like gone home and like, watched a bunch of weird music videos and been like, it's just like me and Ron. <laughs> More realistically. I thought it was good. I think they added a little bit, but I think part of it is, I think I'm a bit biased because I know the relationship of Hermione and Ron a little bit better, so I get it. For you, for not having read the books, Bettina, what do you feel about the Ron-Hermione thing? Do you buy it? Does it seem like they make sense together? Because I think a lot of people thought, based on just the movies, that Hermione and Harry made more sense. So as someone that is just seen the movies how do you fall on the spectrum of their relationship yeah it it didn't really click for me yeah honestly i mean my sister read the books and everything Mm -hmm. and i knew that they were supposed to be together based on what she's been saying and i'm like i i cool so i'll see that right but then now that i think about it they don't they don't really it doesn't really make any sense they don't really have much in common other than the fact she loves them both as friends and then run a little bit more but but why why though Mm -hmm. he's a little fool You know? She just wants to take him to church. Yeah, take him to church, you know? (laughs) Take him to the synagogue? Who knows? (laughs) Bless up. (laughs) I wonder how much of that is script versus just chemistry between the actors. 
Yeah. Like usually you would cast with that in mind, but since they were cast so young, it's right. not like they had them doing chemistry reads. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least not for romantic chemistry. I mean, especially with Harry and Ginny, they're Nothing. non-existent chemistry. It's like you in ever watch reaction. The Good Place. <laughs> yes. And they try to make us think that like Eleanor and Chidi are in love, yeah. and you're just like, I'm just not buying it. Yeah, I that's, think that's, that's true. Pure I chemistry. love that show so much, and that's the one element that I'm like, I just there's just no chemistry between those actors. Right. The script is fine. Yeah. I feel like. I can't tell what's the cause here for this script, but yeah. however it pans out, I don't believe them. Yeah, I don't know if it's an actor thing. I mean, I think part of it is what I was getting at earlier is just they don't show Ron being good at particularly anything. anything. So He's just loyal. He's just kind of there. He's like uh, a dog. Yeah, if so, he did some one thing kind yeah. to, like, towards her, I think I would have been like, okay. I right. see this. But yeah. no, it was very one directional and was, mm-hmm. love that mm-hmm. band. He also <laughs> did well in the Quidditch game. He did. So I guess he has that going for him. Yep. And that's literally where the list ends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So later on, you've got Hermione and Harry talking and Hermione brings up the Romilda Vane thing. She's in the library in the back and she mentions that Romilda Vane really likes Harry and that lays the little seed of she's been talking about using a love potion, which is what later affects Ron. But later on, we get the scene where they go to the Slug Club Christmas party. Luna's outfit, on point. Very good. The big, like, f- reflective-y dress with, like, the ripples and stuff. Don't remember it. Luna's outfit, Slug Club Christmas. <laughs> Every time she does something, like, very, like, like great, you're just, like, very good. As she, if you're, you're giving her a star. Very, <laughs> very good. <laughs> this is her dress. I think it's great. Ooh. Oh, it's like a tiered... Okay. It's like a cake turned into a dress. Mm-hmm. But it feels like something Luna would rock. I think that you lose a little bit of the wizards having weird fashion because they've decided by this film that they just wear normal clothes all the time. Yeah, the robes. They almost really never wear anymore. robes. So I think you lose out on a little bit of wizards wearing funky dress robes and stuff. Can they just like conjure an outfit or do they actually go buy it? I think they so have like to go buy it because no one really ever does it. I think they can do alterations to clothes, but it feels like they always buy stuff. But yeah, you you feel Where's like you could just- Where's everyone getting the money for these cool clothes? I didn't have that in high school. I look like shit in high school. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. I just had to wear a dress code in high school, so I didn't... (sighs) Brag more. (laughs) Oh, man, you're so cool. You had to wear khakis and a polo. (laughs) So dope. That was my uniform, too, khakis. Mm. Yeah. It was khakis, polo, and then you had to wear, like, some sort of, like, leather shoe is what you had to wear. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'd get in trouble. Whoa. That's a little intense. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Then we get more... Draco gets more and more brooding and moody as the movie gets on and it goes a little over the top the way he is outside of the party he is so moody and when he's trying to figure out how to do the vanishing cabinet he just gets so over the top to where it's like a little much but i did appreciate that we get the continuation of drapple which is draco and a green apple the truest pairing in the movies earlier on he in the third movie the fourth movie he like seductively eats a green apple outside of Hagrid's class and then now in this one he puts the apple into the thing and then later on when the apple works in the vanishing cabinet he like grabs the green apple and he's like yes it worked Mm, we stand yeah it's my OTP (laughs) I ship while he's doing this in the vanishing cabinet he starts whispering stuff in Latin which I used the internet plus my I took Latin in high school knowledge he says harmonia nectare passis which means harmony connect and open so he says that over and over again to make the vanishing cabinet work mm, it's a real spell. We're, uh, not in the books but in the movies yes they just do that a lot in the movies where they have real spells but then whoever was in charge of the decision making was like what if they just like said latin shit sure they just <laughs> add more of that yeah, why not? just kind of running with it why not mm-hmm. <laughs> you then get the scene where they're going home for christmas break they're in the hogwarts express going back and you have lavender go up to the window and then just kind of breathe <sighs> Very quickly, but then the entire window gets fogged up. Mm -hmm. And then she draws the heart with the R and the L in between and draws the hearts outside of it. This was just, I don't know. Anytime I've ever tried to write something in fog, it has not worked very well. I haven't Mm. had success and hers came out perfectly. It's magic. It's magic breath. Mm. Or you just suck at doing fog I was going to say, am I just bad? And everyone else is like, yeah, it's really easy. I've drawn Mona Lisa's in the windows. Yeah, I don't think it's hard. (laughs) (laughs) Do you just have soft breaths? You're like, yeah. ah. <laughs> He's it comes up with sound. <laughs> Hyperventilating quietly, trying to write a love letter. 
<laughs> oh, man. So we then move on to the burrow, and we get the scene that we talked about last episode where Ginny tries to feed Harry a treacle tart and says, open, open up that you. Trap, baby. <laughs> open wide. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so awkward. But I do love Ron sitting in between them trying to break it up. That's the good kind of awkward. I think that's very fun. But I just, I don't know. It makes me sad that there's just no chemistry between Harry and Ginny at all. Just like nothing. Not a glimmer of anything. Also, it's like kind of gross to date a freshman when you're a junior, I think. She's only one year below them. So she's a sophomore? Yeah. Or, I mean, she would be in year five and Harry is in year six. So Harry That's is like 16 and she's 15. I think it so was yeah, freshman, junior, freshman, 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 sophomore, junior, senior. <laughs> 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 so yeah. I could see it being a little strange, but just, I don't know. In the books, they definitely have chemistry. They're fun. They give you like they start as more of friends, mm. and then eventually Harry realizes, oh, I like her more as a friend. And I feel like they just don't really have any friendship in the movies leading up to this. And then in this movie, they kind of realize, oh shit, they're supposed to start dating, right? Ah, uh, let's make her tie his shoes, I guess. Right. Which that's the next <laughs> thing. She's she, I guess as a I guess her love language is tying his shoes. I don't know. Seems She's like, like the it, women always are like supposed to take care of the men in these relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like they always make Molly be in the kitchen all yeah. the time, and Molly's a really competent wizard. Yeah, that's why Ron is so horrible at cutting stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's never no, cut. Ron, I got this. This is all I do. I'm your mom, Molly Weasley. I don't know, but yeah, the tying shoes terrible. What was good though was Arthur takes Harry aside and talks about the vanishing cabinet to do all of the exposition about that. I thought that was actually really well done. I love Arthur in the movies. He's so great. Oh, I can't remember that actor's name. He's really good. Meow, come on. I know, so I know. I can't believe it. <laughs> do you want me to? No. Okay. I won't... Too much of a derailment. You're doing it anyway? Okay. Defy me, see what happens. Mark Williams? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like that could have been any name. But the scene... After this is the burrow being on fire scene. My least favorite scene in the movie. Well, I think we're breezing right past my two notes. Uh-huh. Why is Lupin so hot? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like answers. <laughs> and then the second note is that how easily they bait Harry into just chasing them. Yes. It's very depressing to me. I mean, given Harry's track record through the stories, kind of holds true. But the whole scene is very confusing. For your reference, Bettina, this doesn't happen at all in the book. At all. Nothing. No what? semblance of this at all. Okay. Absolutely nothing. And I think it would have been better if it didn't happen. It doesn't it do anything. Because it would be anything. so much creepier to just know that the Death Eaters are doing something. Mm -hmm. but we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Instead of just continually seeing them and they're just doing these tiny, weird little half attacks. Just none of it makes sense. They fly in. They make a big ring of fire. Then Bellatrix effectively goes, catch me if you can, by screaming, nah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much runs away. Harry's dumbass chases after her. And, and then conveniently, they left a Harry sized gap in the ring of fire, which closes right after, Ginny runs through it. <laughs> right after the two of them run through it. And then you've got Lupin and Tonks with intense wand choreography Oof. trying to make that work. Talk about chemistry. Those two actors. Yep, 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 it's yep, good. Yep. The way that Tonks holds her wand is very interesting, too, because it's a full fist sideways kind of thing yeah. like she's it's like shooting the gun sideways yeah she's a bamf that's dude. how cool people use magic <laughs> i would love to talk to i never talked to him but when i was at leaky con they also had the wand choreographer <gasps> at leaky con and he was a very interesting man i never got to speak to him but i just saw him around he was there for two days one day he was wearing royal blue pants like dickie's action cargo pants okay and then a blue polo shirt. Monochromatic. And the, okay. Yeah, and then almost the exact same hue. And then the next day, he had the exact same outfit, except orange Dickies, orange polo. <gasps> okay. Power suit. Uh, it Whoa. was very interesting. It's like if a jumpsuit was made out of individual items, but like... There's a reason he was the lawn coordinator. I, that's the thing. When I saw him, I was like, that's 100% the guy. a lot of power. I wanted to talk to him. But he was doing wand choreography. That was you could like buy a ticket to do like oh wand choreography God. with him. I just want to know what it was what like. I'll eventually talk to him at some point. Harry runs through the fire. Ginny runs through the fire. How does Ginny's robe stay on? Am I well, again? This could be me off, being. You fucking I do not want it to fall off. <laughs> Why are you doing this? I do not. Bro. The only time I ever wear robes is when I'm in a hotel and they have a free robe, mm. and I don't know if this is my lack of robe experience, mm. but I struggle to keep it in a good situation, just like walking around a hotel room. How mm. can she sprint through a field of tall grass and marsh and boggy swamp water? Magic. 
I guess. Oh, maybe it's magic. Don't. <laughs> or maybe you just suck with a robe. I, I could just suck with a robe. I don't know. I'm not a robe those, person. It's kind of silly, but they have like those butt belt buttons. loops. Oh, yeah. the interior button. The interior button. So you button the th- inner thing first, flap it over, tie it. The tie oh, is more decorative. Yeah. I've never had an interior button robe. Also, like if you go to Japan, uh-huh. they have all kinds of ways of tying robes. Okay. Word, word, word. It's word. like the Boy Scouts of robes, where they can. Oh, here's a sailor's knot. Yeah, and I think I probably have this wrong, but if you're wearing the, um, I want to say it's called. I'm not gonna get yakata or something. I'm going to get it wrong. There's like this cool overcoat thing mm-hmm. that you put on top of the robe. Um, if you fold, I want to say you have to do left over right. Because if you go right over left with the front it means you're dead. It means you're something. dead. Yeah. Yeah. It's like how they bury corpses. Oh. Fact check that because I don't, I didn't get half that right, but it's something like that. That seems like a fun joke to play on a tourist where you'd have to no, be like, No, they you tell have... you very specifically, do not do that. Oh, like, what, will people be offended? Like, what's, Good or will question. people think you're not. a zombie and they'll be like, <laughs> Like that you will just scare. I think you just look real dumb. Mm, okay, okay, I can see it. I can Didn't see it. try it. Not brave enough. Mm, that's yeah. That'd be <laughs> uh, that'd be an ultimate flex. <laughs> but yeah, the scene is just so strange because they just go into the middle of this swamp, and then the Death Eaters are just in the grass. And they don't really have an agenda. No, they just wanted to scare them. I guess. Yeah, bored. What, it, what else is there to do I, around I, there? I, a lot though. Like they're planning a global takeover. There's probably a lot to be doing. Harry and Ginny just throw <laughs> vague spells around. I assume it's stupefy, but they don't really say. They're just like throwing sparks. Eventually, the other people catch up. And then the Death Eaters decide, oh, man, we got to get out of here for whatever reason. They're not that outnumbered or whatever. Well, they got to go light the house on fire. Exactly. They fly away. They crash through the house. It goes on fire. And then everyone just fucking watches the house burn down? Yeah, great question again about this burning spell technology. I just... You stop, have, stop a burn They have spells that make water shoot out of their wands. Everyone do it at the same time. There needs to be a Command Z spell. Ooh, be pretty good. Shake your wand. Just undo. <laughs> uh, I do hate that my phone is always like, undo typing? Like, no, I'm just walking. <laughs> you can turn it off. I should. Can you? Mm-hmm. I got to do that. Okay. I got to turn off that, and I have to turn off... I don't know if anyone else has a Mac laptop where if you force click over a word, it tries to look it up in the dictionary. Mm, I don't have that. Whoa. I don't know what thing it is, but I do it all the time and I hate it. And I've never once been on a website and be like, what does this word mean? And not just open a tab in Google and like, I'm going to force click. Yeah, but you can't even tie a robe. And won't even respond. Yeah. Stop! I can't, I can't tie a robe. I can't draw in fog. <laughs> I'm so bad at everything. Well, at this point, we've been talking quite a bit, so I think let's take a pause really quick here so that uh, we can save it for a future episode. But Miel and Bettina, thank you so much for coming on to discuss the sixth movie with me here in this wonderful studio here in scenic Greenpoint, Brooklyn. If Thanks people, for having me. Well, of course. Uh, if people want to find you doing some stuff, where can they find you doing stuff? Bettina, what stuff are you doing? Oh, I do some music. Mm-hmm. I go by Valiant Vermin, all streaming mm-hmm. platforms, mm-hmm. and social media by Bethole. Bat hole with an E instead of a U. Yes, the joke <laughs> is that. <laughs> Sounds like. Boot hole. <laughs> boot hole. You know, when your boot gets a hole in it. <laughs> what about you, Miel? Uh, Miel and Miel Monster. And if you like me on this podcast, you might like my podcast, Punch Up the Jam. It's very good. We write a song fun. every single week. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take you to edit the podcast? Do people also get surprised for you that like podcasts take time to work on? I don't edit my podcast. Oh, but the you have a great team. <laughs> I do all my own research. Good. I clip the songs myself, and I write a song every yeah, single Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's enough. <laughs> yes, I don't have time to edit. You, yeah, you've got enough going and on. And I have a Patreon that has totally Lots independent of content. Lots of stuff. It's so much work. People, it's it's funny when I tell people now that I'm a full time podcaster. Like some people, are like that's just your job. It's like, yeah, I got a lot. Dude, are people like being like this social media intern? I'm like, that's a full ass <laughs> job running a brand social media account. Yeah. don't call them an intern. Mm-hmm. That's a salaried employee who works really hard. Mm-hmm. It's also fun when people like condescendingly ask me like, oh, and that pays the bills. It's like, Fuck you. yeah, dude. <laughs> 2020. I'm a one person small business. My payroll is me. It's dope. <laughs> How's your little music going? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, the burn. Oh, man. Well, Speaking of the burn, fire in these movies. Yay. Well, I can't wait to do that next episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter before they get asked condescending questions by their uh, friends and family members at holidays. Wizard on. 
You've heard me talk about the Multigroup before, but we are revamping it for 2020. Multitude is an independent collection of people betting on each other. We want to make podcasting things happen for you, and your support in the Multicrew makes that happen. It lets us do big picture stuff. It lets us have an office. It lets us host events. It lets us make more amazing podcasts. So if you join the Multicrew, you can be the engine that fuels Multitude. We've added a new $5 a month tier where you get access to the exclusive RSS feed of Head, Heart, Gut. There's a whole bunch of new information about the program itself. If you want to learn more, go to multicrew.club today. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Jesse Horgan, Klauser, Lopu, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Ponce, Anfilio, Rosemary, Dodge, Marie, Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivadonier, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Ross, Ann Batamana, Nikita Power, Ali Madsen, Amelia Krauss, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Orchid Grower, Vivian, the Owl, Takari, Ron, Haley Hastings, Moster, Ingen, Oddstotter, Alex Consilver, John Codker, Noel Basile, Emily Tyrell, Liz Bigelow, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Ensign, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Mark, Lou, Friday, Jay Svensson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Summer Rathel, Andrea Crock, Lynn Walker, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Parrish, Toothless Walnut, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Netta Atabani, Zena Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Addy, Nikki Harris, Kine, Amanda Alfred, Alicia McLaren, Kafir Shaltiel, Lindy Placky, Sarah Shedder, Marta Morrison, Aaron Richter, Eileen Gazesh, Violet Sullivan, Lindsay Towning, Keegan Curran, Miranda Manning, Gail Ann, Mr. Folk, Maya, Kieran, Lily Leader Williams, Wire Warrior 4976, Floor Sake, Siri Scars, Ford, Georgia, Peter Wyckoff, Skylar Lily, Edel Ryan, Professor Thread, Ellie Hoskov Chova, Daniel Fulkerson, Lee Lidley, Elizabeth Christofferson, Michael David Yordi, Tiffany Cottrell, Kelly Otilio, Carrie Crumpler, Connie Bienkowski, Mary Mateel, Jennifer Wendt, Jaden Allman, Nedry OS, Will Huser, Samantha Lentz, Kayla M. Simino, Aurora Fruhoff, Emma Clark, Out of Context 69, Marco Cepeda, Hannah Zeters, Cordy Spilker, Victoria McCormick, Marie Rieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Phelan, Julie Walton, The Meadows Family, Ginny from the Block, Anna Penalber, Alvarez, Fake Valentine, Brianna Jordan, Jenny, Sarah Saunders, McKenna Tweedy, Mary Joy Moi, Heather, Weekend at Dead Cat Ladies, Javi Guadalupe, Trejo the Third, Darlene Kerr, Brad Harding, Thomas Chavara, Charlotte, Brianna Cusimano, Kevin Stewart, Lori McDonald, Chris. Chrissy Tew, Bugaboo, Jarl Sviven, Haley Logan, Emma, Ashley Enstrom, Peter McGrath, Sophie Duda, Jack McMahon, Jan and Rose Dab, Nicole Linzer, Callahan and Deras, Kyla the Husky, Leah Reed, Melissa Robb, Jordy Wright, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Bill Gill, Victoria Colca Perry, Joe Radwan, Elizabeth Yu, Britt McLean, Molly Bautista, Becca Spry, Anthony Reese Dignan, Adam Graham, Joseph Torp, Courtney Harris, T Run Money, Madison, Kyle, G, Maximilian Vos, Luca Holbling, Don't Call Me Nymphadora, Steamed Nuggets, and Care Die Potter, Web Design by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Kumbamanas. If you want to find us on social media, you can at Facebook dot com slash Potterless, Twitter dot com slash Potterless Pod, Instagram dot com slash Potterless Podcast, and Reddit dot com slash r slash Potterless. For more information about the show, you can go to Potterless dot com for bonus content. You can go to Patreon dot com slash Potterless, and for merchandise, you can go to Bit dot ly slash Merch On. If you want to see me live in Phoenix, go to Bit dot ly slash Potterless PHX. If you want to see me live in Los Angeles, go to Multitude dot Production slash Live. If you want to tell someone about the show, whether it's online through a review or in person, that really helps. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Was it on?